So I'll get started. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to read this quote. Um, it, I share this with teachers and parents and anyone who kind of is thinking about what science looks like for their child. Um, it just gives me a little goosebumps, like is that idea of people thinking that science is not for them, but it's in our whole everyday life. Um, and we'll talk more about what that looks like today. Um, and just a quick, this is our agenda. We're gonna do a little intro, um, talk about the shifts that are happening, three dimensions. Um, we're gonna be looking into what constitutes as a science phenomena and what we do with it. And um, the part that I think is the most beneficial is a teacher toolkit at the end that you'll kind of get a briefing of how they work so that you'll be able to use them in the unit um, and know what they are when you see the words um, in this toolkit in the units. So let's start with who's in the room. We'll start with myself. Um, I'm Jamie Stevens. Um, I've taught everywhere, um, originally from California and married an Australian. So um, I've been in both places and we um, met in Shanghai, China while I was teaching out there. And um, then we moved with COVID happened and we got stuck outside of China and ended up um, in Singapore. And then now I'm in Chicago. So we just, we, I don't know if you can hear it, but there's Chicago in the background. <laughs> um, and I've, I've also been a STEAM instructional coach for the past few years in Shanghai and um, worked with the Department of um, Overseas Schools in Washington, D.C. to help write science curriculum. Um, and my big passion is around um, maker labs and design studios, and that's where I started to get into this engineering piece. Um, when I was in California, I worked with different elementary schools to turn their laptop rooms into maker labs. Um, I'm also a new mom. I'm an eight-week-old, and that's her in the picture. And um, I just love to do all things outside adventuring. Um, if it's something new and I haven't done it before, I'm usually game to try it. So that's a bit about me. Um, and I'm gonna start us off with a little chance for us to introduce ourselves. I assume most of you guys know each other, but I'd love to get to know you guys a little bit. Um, just a quick who you are. Um, and you can share one, or if you want to more of the following, um, a memory of learning science, um, something that has made you wonder or wonder how or why something happens, um, or just finishing the sentence, when I think about science and engineering, it's important to me that my students fill in the blank. And then in regards to NGSS, I wanna know more about the following. Um, I'll give you guys kind of a minute or so to think if there's anyone that really wants to start. Go ahead. Um. I want to start because I want to make a clarification, if you don't mind, about NGSS. Yeah. Hi, my name is Fatima, uh, and I am a assistant, a research associate professor at the University of Oregon, and the principal investigator for this project that is funding um, the design of this elementary curriculum for third to fifth grade and is focused on uh, teaching science. And I know that Tennessee hasn't adopted the NGSS standards, but that your standards are very well aligned with NGSS and it's also based on the three dimension. So Jamie is gonna be using this term a lot, but keep in mind that the similarities between the two are really high and Jennifer you can correct me if I'm wrong um, but we have been designing the curriculum with NGSS in mind and based on the NGSS rubric um, so so you know and I so think I share, share one there. answer of those in regards to the NGSS what do I know <laughs> I want to know more yes I'm always <laughs> want to know more <laughs> about NGSS particularly about a specific phenomenon that is gonna be um, engaging for students in the learning process. So, hi, 
I'm Bailey. I'm a research assistant with Escalar. I have an undergraduate degree in physics, and I'm currently completing my master's in education in instructional design. Uh, one of the first physics problems that I really, really wanted to chew over, I was a kid and I wanted a swing in my backyard and we didn't have one. And I didn't understand why I couldn't hold myself and swing myself with my arms. <laughs> so I really wanted to uh, unpack the physics behind that, even though it took a couple years, but I know the answer now. <laughs> Um, I'm Jamie Linkus. I um, teach third grade math and science at Andersonville Elementary. This is my 16th year teaching. Um, and honestly, I'll combine a couple of my earliest memory of learning science, whether it was in middle school or high school or in college. The ones that stuck with me and the ones that I still remember are the ones that were hands on labs. So I love that. I mean, I'm, as an adult, I can look back in middle school labs and know what I did and what the purpose of behind them were. And I just want my kids to have some of those same experiences that when they grow up, they know even just a little part of science just because of something they did in here. Um, but it was always the hands-on stuff. It was never just the things I read. <laughs> so that's why I'm kind of leaning more toward um, in this one, in this, you know, experience. So my name is Jennifer Rodebaugh. I'm the academic, one of the academic coaches at um, Claxton Elementary, and I'm also helping to try and organize um, our district's science curriculum. Um, my very um, earliest memory of learning science was in fifth grade. My very best friend in the world, her mother was my fifth grade teacher. And I come from a farming community in Ohio, and we were learning about um, parts of the human body and how different organs worked. And um, she actually brought in parts of a butchered pig that we were able to explore and look at the heart and the lungs and the eyes. And I remember thinking that this was just the very best day ever. And from then on, I've just been anything science related. I feel like I can link it to anything and make it interesting for kids. So. Uh, that was that was my hook from early on. Um, Jamie, before we jump on, can I ask, are we gonna, um, is this being recorded right now? I, we have two teachers that um, are doing after school clubs and aren't able to attend here live. Will this be recorded so that they can? Um, I think the team is recording it, she said. So, is that correct? Thumbs up, that's right. The team are you recording? Yeah. Hi, my name is Chance Ward. I am a teacher here at Clacton Elementary, and uh, I've been working with the children here at Clacton for 21 school years now. My earliest memory of science, I have to go back to my fifth grade year. I grew up in a Montessori school, and I still remember the hands-on project and the experiment uh, that we did, and a similar story to what Ms. Brotherball said we were able to look at the layer, the stomach of a cow. So uh, one of our uh, parents had a dairy farm and one of the cows had passed away. So we were able to uh, look at the different chambers of a stomach and I still remember that and, uh, and the smell, so. Um, I'll go ahead next. Um, so my name is Amanda Irwin, and this is my um, second year at Bryce School um, teaching third grade. Um, a memory that I have of science, I must have had a great seventh grade science teacher because that goes back to a few of the things that I remember. But one of the things I remember the most is that we were talking about weather and he brought in a barometer so we could actually see, you know, when the pressure was dropping and this was in the like the winter spring of 94 so when we had the blizzard and i was living in ohio at the time um so i mean we saw the barometer drop and within like the next 24 hours we were out of school which never happened um because we had a great big old blizzard so um that's one of the things that i remember and that's you know why I wanted to do this um, this training because I want my my students to be able to have those aha moments and those 
um, those things that they remember. Oh yeah, I remember when we did this. And so they can link it back to something that they'll kind of take with them when they leave. I'm Danny Vance, and I've been teaching at Lake City Elementary School for 18 years. This is my second year in third grade. That's okay. Um, and when I think about science and engineering, it's important to me that my students are engaged and learn. I'm Jessica Normal. I teach third grade at Norwood Elementary. This is my eighth year here. I taught second grade for four years, and this is my fourth year in third grade. Um, it is important to me that my students gain an understanding of just how stuff works. I think that's what gets them really excited. Um, and I just, I, when I think back on teaching science, like all of the moments that my students are so excited is when we are doing things like showing light reflecting off of a mirror, like how the moon reflects the sun or um, to study um, like solids and liquids. We poured liquid onto the floor and said, look, it's the shape of the floor. And they just get so excited over small things like that. So um, I just want to do more of that. Uh, this is Amy Cordell. I teach third grade math and science at Lake City. This is my first year at Lake City, and um, I have taught at other schools. And um, I teach math and science this year. And my first memory of science is um, eighth grade. We did um, experiments and all. And that's my first my first recollection of science. And I really want to uh, be able to have my students do hands-on because I think hands-on makes them remember rather than looking at a PowerPoint or um, reading from a book. I'm Kayla Baird. I teach third grade at Norwood Elementary. This is my second year teaching. Um, back in elementary school, middle school, and even high school, I really didn't have a strong science background. We didn't do a lot of stuff. I remember tracing and coloring plant and animal cells. Um, so when I got into college and I took a STEM class and started taking physical science, I knew that like STEM and STEAM, and I think now it's branched off into STREAM, like that's been the route that I've went with my students. And um, last year I actually won a $5,000 STEM grant so I got a 3D printer and some different robots for my classroom and then a lot of makerspace supplies. So all the hands-on stuff has been really helpful, helpful for my kids um, to see how things work and getting to like do everything hands-on. They retain it better and they love to do these things and they look forward to having science and they want to know what activity we're doing when we're learning this and just the different types of things that we can do. So I'd like to know more about how we can incorporate things like that into this curriculum that we're going to start. This is great. You guys are all on the right hopes and wishes aspect of things. Um, and I'm going to kind of dive in so that we can get to all the good stuff. Um, and just a quick preview of our exit ticket. I'm going to be asking guys to think about these things at the end and share out um, whether it might maybe share out or maybe just think about it and share if you want um, but I'd like to start it off so that you guys know what's coming at the end um, and then I want to talk to you a bit about how we learn science now and a lot of you guys have already mentioned the aspect of you know some being hands-on which is huge um, and not just reading about it and the way I like to analyze and if you even need to talk to parents about it, is that we learn it like a sport. If I was learning, if I was learning to swim or if I was teaching my daughter to swim, you know, if I read her a book about swimming and we watched a video about swimming and we played a game about swimming and then I threw her in a pool, I can't say that she's going to be a successful swimmer. 
So when we look at science now, we want to do those things. We do want them to read about it. We do want them to see examples of professional swimming, and we do want them to engage in different simulations, but we also want them to actually be a scientist, just like we want them to do the swimming. Um, some of the big changes that you may or may not notice when we go through this and you go through the unit is that we're looking at sense making. So as opposed to um, doing something and being like, we did it, we're doing it with a purpose. We're doing it, trying to figure out some big phenomena, we're trying to make sense of it, and we're purposefully doing maybe a hands-on activity, maybe a book, maybe an interactive to help make meaning. Um, science in the past, maybe engineering and technology were maybe separate and you would do a fun engineering project, but now it's really all integrated. And you're gonna see that in this unit, um, how much that's integrated, um, the science standards as well as the engineering standards. This is a big one um, and I'll go into it more detail, um, but essentially we're not force feeding vocab ahead of time. So what we used to do, and I remember when I first started teaching, it was like, or even when I was learning science, you get your flashcards and you're like, okay, learn all the words, learn about photosynthesis. Okay, what's photosynthesis? Here's the definition. What's a leaf? Here's the definition. So instead of that, we're actually giving the students experiences and they are naming things like, oh, I noticed that the sun made the leaf turn green. Oh, you know what? We have a word for that. Scientists have a word for that, for that process. It's called photosynthesis. Let's, let's name it now when we get to use that as our science word. So that's a big one for elementary school. And you're going to, and it's, especially if you have um, English language learners or students with, um, learning differences, they tend, we tend to want to give them things ahead of time, but really it's beneficial to let them figure it out. And just like some of you guys said, you remember things more because you did it, you're, they're going to remember that word or those, that experience more, um, how to do science. So explicit teaching. Um, and I'm going to go more into that as well about how do we explicitly teach someone how to be a scientist, just like we explicitly teach them how to read. Um, and again, integration of reading, writing, and math. And I know elementary school teachers are the best at this because we have no other choice time-wise. <laughs> and um, focus on thinking patterns and asking questions, analyzing, um, really getting students to be and talk like scientists. So I'm gonna, I gave you guys an email, um, a link to an email, and it looks, let me see if I can find, example what it looks like here and all I want you to do is just take a quick look at it and on either side you don't have to do one for all of them maybe just do three something that gets you excited just put an exclamation mark next to it um, something that you feel like this is super important to you um, and then something you still wonder about if you look at this and you're like, mm, I'm not I would like to know more about this or I'm wondering more. So there's, you'll notice it's kind of a this and a that used to be or less of more of. Um, so go ahead and do that. And then it's just a quick protocol to give us, get us thinking. And I apologize for the noise. Um, I live across the street from the fire station. So. <laughs> Joyful with the new thing. OK. 
I haven't yet had a chance to read through them. There any a big one is if there's any questions about something that you maybe would want more clarifications on, feel free to take a look or put a little question mark and I'll make sure to cover it. If not now, then next time or later this session. Is there a way to make it bigger? That is, there is one. Thank you. Does that work? Yes, it's better. Okay, I'm gonna, you guys are continue to do this if you um, would like. Um, I have, so as we go through, keep in mind these shifts and some of them are probably very familiar to you. Um, and some of them might be like, oh, that's not what I thought or that's not what I'm used to and that's okay. That's why it's a shift. And it's, it's an exciting time in science, I think. Um, what we're gonna talk about first with that is the base, like the core to science learning, which is around practices the core ideas and how students think. So if you're looking at um, NGSS or your science curriculum, your practices are how students learn. It's what scientists do, it's the, the doing. Um, core ideas is the content, your life science, your engineering, your physical science, your earth science, it's the, the ideas, right? The knowledge, I guess you can say, that they're gonna walk away with. And the cross-cutting concepts are these big ideas. It's how we think as scientists. Um, I would love um, when we, when a lot of teachers would notice that some of our cross-cutting concepts go across curriculums. You'll see that finding a pattern, you do that in math, you do that in reading, you do that in science. So these are sometimes you might even say they're across disciplines, disciplinary, but also they're, they go across all of the core ideas. So in life science, we'll have all of the cross-cutting concepts. Um, again, just to reiterate, because it's so important, it's really, they, students will use all of these things in every lesson to explain the phenomena. It's not just, okay, we're going to make a graph today. It's really, we're making a graph to explain something in the content area and we're looking for something in that graph. We might be looking for a pattern or we might be looking for a relationship. So, or a cause and effect. So it's these three things happen simultaneously together. So that's something you're gonna be, you're gonna be really looking for. And the hard part is, is you're assessing all three of these at the same time as well. So you're assessing how do they do the science and how are they thinking about it and also do they have the content? Because you might have two out of the three, right? They might know the content really well. You got these kids that are like, I know everything, but they can't explain their thinking, right? And they just know, right? I just, how do you know? I just know they're those, those kids. And so you, you might have a one or a two out of those. So keeping that in mind as well. Jamie. So we'll start. Yeah. 
Oh, if you let me say something in the in that slide you had, um, you teachers know that there is there is not a lot of uh, materials in out there for NGSS, and the few that are claiming themselves to be NGSS aligned, if you look at them carefully, most of them do not address the three dimensions. They typically at least address one or two at the same time but the three dimensions, and we um, made that mistake in the past for our middle school curriculum, which we designed and started design prior to NGSS. Um, we were focusing more on the concepts rather than uh, all the three dimensions, and we are in the process of updating the middle school curriculum for that, for that reason, but I just wanted to point that out because of the difficulty of addressing the three dimensions, I think there is a lack of curriculum out there. It's definitely a hard thing. I, I agree. And it's also, um, I would say for elementary teachers, probably easier than it is for middle school teachers because we're really good already at blending a lot of these things. Um, I'll give you an example with practices right now. Um, a lot of these you're going to notice are similar to your reading and writing practices, your expectations for readers. Um, readers can use evidence when they make an argument um, in their writing, or I mean, writers can use evidence to make an argument. Um, readers can communicate what they've read and explain or summarize the information that they've read. So you'll see a lot of these fall under the stuff that you're already doing. And when we are doing these practices, just like with, or we're asking students to do. To feel successful. And you're gonna be like, why aren't they doing it? So really giving them the explicit modeling of how you do it, of giving them tools and scaffolds to help them know how to ask a good scientific question. Most of your students think that they know how to ask a scientific question. They may or may not. Um, same thing with using models. It's like when you're teaching to your students and you're asking them to model their thinking, we have to actually show them what that looks like and show them a bunch of different ways that looks, explicit teaching around that. Um, I'm going to show you guys a video and I'm just trying to remember which video it is. And I want you to think, what do you notice the student practicing? What actual practices? And as a teacher, what might you do to help him with these practices? So I'm going to...
to share out what they think, but they notice what what um, science and engineering practices. Did you notice that he was trying to practice? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. I see a lot of investigating there. Now, I couldn't hear what was going on in the background, but I saw the student doing a lot of investigating there. But something else that I'd noticed is tying in a math standard. I saw something on the table that looked like a bar graph. So it was almost a uh, tying in the math and science. And I saw a lot of uh, investigating and a little bit of trying this and that. Going with that, using the graph that he was using, which is the mathematics part, he's also analyzing that data. Anything that as a teacher you think you would need to explicitly teach him to help him um, to practice that you would need some more assistance explicit So I probably would have focused on how to construct your explanation because um, obviously the teacher was doing a great job prompting those questions of what we would want to draw out in the explanation. But like at one point when asked how he was organizing his data, he just like pointed to the graph. So probably some direct instruction with how you could stem that out and <laughs> create a construct a response back to share that information would be important. he is an English language learner. So for him, for a lot of your English language learners, you're going to spend a lot of time teaching them to explicitly how to explain what they're thinking um, and how to communicate that information. And again, that's in your language arts, your literacy standards as well. So it transfers over and over again. Um, to kind of make it even more <laughs> explicit, here's a, a Venn diagram that shows a lot of the practices that overlap. So you'll notice that it's not just in science that we are engaging in argument and evidence. You're doing it in math, you're doing it in literacy. Um, it's just something to really think about. Um, one thing I'd like to do when I'm teaching is to remind students, be like, you know, when reading, when we look for a pattern, we're gonna scientists do the same thing and just helping them link that in so they know okay, we look for patterns not just in math or not just in reading, but in science as well, um, and helping them see how that connects to the bigger picture, to the real world around us. Um, okay, one more little video. This one, just, I want you guys to be thinking about what is he trying to figure out? What is he thinking? So thinking about that video, and if any of you have toddlers, you've probably experienced the joy of pots and pan day. Um, but what is he thinking about? This, you know, this is something that we'll see that students do often in that they are being scientists all the time. So what do you guys think he was trying to think about or figure out?
Uh, maybe just the connection between his sa- the sound and when he actually hit um, the cause and effect there. Um, and I also noticed like he was trying to figure out the lid, like if he could go in it sometimes, or maybe the lid was over there. So, yeah. Yeah. Cause and effect. Um, you can also be thinking like the structure and function, how things are come together. How do they work? Um, you may have noticed a pattern. He's kind of like, oh, I can do this and make this noise. I can hit this and then hit that and boom, 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 boom. And when we think about some of these cross cutting concepts, they fall under three big ideas, causation or causality. I can't say the word, so I just say causation, um, patterns, and then different systems. So energy, scale and proportion, stability and change, um, systems and system models. And this is really how scientists think about or make um, and understand understand the phenomena that's in the, around the world. They make sense of it using these ideas. So if you're going back to the, the boy with the magnets, he was trying to find a stability and change, right? When does this move? When does it not move? But at the same time, he's also looking for a pattern or like a, a not pattern, right? Just because it doesn't make a pattern doesn't mean it's not still under the patterns. It's just that it doesn't make one cause and effect. So he's doing all this thinking. And again, it's really our job to let him know that he's doing that using those words. So we'd say, so you're noticing a pattern that the more little magnets you have, the stronger it is. Yes. Okay. Can you, and asking them to say it, okay, can you use that word patterns next time we talk about this or in your writing, can you use the word patterns when you talk about what you figured out and giving them those tools. And I'll give you guys some language sentence stems at the end of this today to help get those started. Um, But that's a huge piece for elementary school. Same way you give them sentence stems for explaining their math or explaining their reading um, with their reading partners. It's the same type of idea. So we're using the same teacher tools in science. And then the core ideas, Um, I know you guys aren't doing NGSS totally, but just so you know, um, the third grade unit you'll be working on is weather and climate. And it comes with the idea that in kindergarten, they've had a similar unit um, at a kindergarten level based off of um, seasons and cause and effect um, around seasons around the the year. Um, I'm going to pause for a second for any questions before I move on to the next section. Are there any big wonders, anything that you guys want a clarification on? I just want to add, Jamie, I like how you are prompting us to think how intentional we need to be at helping students using the science terminology because they won't will likely not use it unless we prompt them and so it is important that we start recognizing that students may be using the descriptions without the proper vocabulary so we need to intentionally help them so thank you for sharing that Kids love it. They're like, like I'm gonna give you a special science word, and they're like, I'm gonna use this big, huge science word all the time. And I think elementary school kids love it. Um, and kind of our base and the the core to all of our teaching is around a phenomena. And at the start, some of you shared things that you uh, wondered about, um, or that something that kind of made you go, wow or experiences you had as a kid. And, and a lot of those could have been based in, in a phenomena. Someone had shared about the cow dying and looking at the stomach. And I think that could be a phenomenon itself. Like what happens to, and then here he goes, why do dead things disappear over time? What's gonna happen to that cow 
I mean, I don't want to get into the details, but if it was left, if it was hit or well, roadkill, what would happen? Right. And that brings you into like a big core, not so much idea, but core event that everyone in the class is going to try to figure out together. It brings us to the place where we're saying, you know what, we, it's equitable in the sense that we're all trying to figure out the same thing and we can figure it out in a bunch of different ways. A great phenomena allows you to do a bunch of different things to figure it out. It's not an easy answer. Um, things like where does our clean water come from and where does it go after we make it dirty? Well, it could be an easy answer. You have kids that are going to say like, oh, it goes down the drain and um, it comes out the faucet. Great. How does the water get clean that comes out of the faucet? Most of the kids might not know. So you, that's where the questions come in. The things that we don't know in, in here, in our answers, the things that we can't add to or explain, that becomes a question. And that's our job as teachers with that phenomena to teach them to say, ooh, why are homes different around the world? And one kid might go, oh, because they're at different places in the world and they, you know, different people built them. Okay. okay. Why did they build them differently? You know, because they wanted to. And, you know, giving them the chance to say, okay, well, why is this roof so slanted and this roof rounded? Oh, we're not sure. That would be a question then. That's, an, that's a question we're going to add to our, and we'll discuss our driving question board. Why are some roofs shaped differently? So teaching them how to take something they don't know and turning it into a question is great if you have a great phenomena. If you have a loose and a, a kind of a phenomena that is quick and easy to answer, like um, what's inside a volcano, that's factual. You're going to be like, boom, boom, boom. Oh, here's, you know, here's all the pieces. Here's the parts of the earth. Here's that the volcano works. A bigger phenomena around that might be something like, how do islands appear and disappear in the middle of the ocean? It broadens it. It's something they can see, something that they wonder about, and it's an observable event. It's something that would happen again and again. And we can use science knowledge to explain it or predict why it happens. Engineering also uses phenomena and we integrate it in the sense that we're looking for design solutions. If there's a phenomena around um, landslides, right? In Japan, there was this huge landslide that happened and they're trying to figure out why it happened, how it happened. They figured out it had to do with the vegetation and the lack of trees that got cut down to um, by a different company, and then the water just came pushing down. That's the big answer, but there's a lot of things to figure it out. The design solution would be, how do we stop this from happening? Engineers have to use the science knowledge to make a solution. They have to know, okay, if I know that the seasons in Chicago are hot and humid, and then suddenly it's winter and it's mass snow, I'm not going to make my roofs flat, unless you're Frank Lloyd Wright, which he does, but <laughs> you want to make them so that the snow falls off the sides as, an, as a designer. You guys will be working with the phenomena around why homes are different around the world. And it's a really fun one because it has a huge mix of all the disciplines. It include, and we'll get into that on Thursday. Um, but it's one of my favorite things to find a really good phenomena. Um, and once you do have that good phenomena in the class, this is what it looks like. You explore this anchoring phenomena, you get really into it, you ask questions, you notice things, and then you're trying to make sense of them. And you're using all of those practices that we discussed to make sense of what happened or why it happened. 
And to do that, you might find some related phenomena. For example, if you're doing the homes unit, you would say, okay, I'm gonna ask some questions about designing and roofs and stuff like that. But also a related phenomena is that the temperature in certain bands of the world is the same. Let's, let's discuss that. Are homes the same along that same band? Or a phenomena around Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere, how the weather is, is similar but different. And then always looking for next steps. What do we need to know now? So I'm going to pause there again. Any big wonders about phenomena? Anyone have a phenomena that you're thinking about that you've used before that you are wondering or if there's something with this model that you're thinking about, wondering about? I like to connect this a lot with um, math and how we um, teach math now around these big ideas of in, you know, you might be learning multiplication and we might not do just rote multiplication, but we want to make sense of what does multiplication look like. We want to understand where it's used in the world and how it's used and it might relate to other things, it might relate to addition, it's going to relate to division, it's going to relate to me making a pattern, right? Um, and you'll see this same sequence in our units as we go forward. And it's really this place here where a lot of your explicit teaching will happen. The so with that explicit teaching, yeah. Um, gave me the phenomenal learning approach is somewhat new for everybody, I think, in the field. Yeah. Uh, if you agree with me on that. So maybe teachers haven't used it yet, which is completely understandable. So maybe they want to share whether or not they have experience. If not, what leader have they hear about it may be helpful and what, what wonders they have about it. So I guess that the main question is, is this a new approach for teaching for all of you? I usually, I have not done it in the past. Um, you know, we've done like a big question or we've tried to do like a STEM, but as far as I usually present those as much, we usually don't develop them together um, for, you know, so that's a neat approach that I haven't, haven't gotten to do yet. Great, thanks for sharing. And Jessica, you saw your teachers using it last year. Any thoughts about how things went with your third grade teachers? I mean, Jennifer, sorry. She might be. Well, uh, it's okay if it's new. Uh, like I said, it's, it's, it was new to us. It's a relatively new teaching approach and but there is a lot of evidence of how effective it is and how good it is for uh, helping kids engaging in science and making sense on science. So hopefully through this training and the use of our, our materials, you become more of an expert on, on this teaching approach. I'm gonna add on to that and say that this is how scientists work. This is why it's changed. This is what scientists actually do. They go into the world and they say, oh my goodness, I've noticed 
X, Y, Z. Let's make sense of it. Let's figure it out. Um, everything from animal extinction. Why are animals extinct? This particular animal suddenly extinct or why are some animals coming back out of nowhere? And science, that's a phenomenon. They want to figure it out. And this is how they do it. So we really want to give this phenomena piece, the reason why it's so huge is that it's actually what scientists do. They look at something and go, how can I figure out why this happens, how this happens, and be able to explain myself, explain to others what I think is happening. Um, and as, as we go through, you're going to see different ways that we engage in this phenomena um and for you guys you'll see next on thursday next time we chat a bit more about how this looks for your students and how we unpack a phenomena um and that's part of here this treating students like scientists so this is like a, a toolkit and i'll send you guys some of these as well so you have them but i'm going to go through them as well and same that scientists do, they take this idea, they take the driving question board or their driving question and the phenomena and they stick it up there and they don't just do it alone. Scientists don't sit there by themselves in a dark room and like, I'm going to figure this out. They have a team and the team looks at it and they throw all the questions that could possibly help them understand this phenomena. So, this example here is from a fifth grade unit around um, why dead things disappear. It started off with just these post-its. And then as the questions got answered, you'll see they added their answers here. And as they started to model different things that happened, they've added that on there. They've added images of their data. And the big piece around this is that it's something that all the kids can, can see at all times. So it's, it helps give those kids grounds them a little bit to say, remember, this is our big question. You went here, we're here. Um, it helps them realize what we're figuring out along the way. We know that there's holidays. We know that there's interruptions. And this kind of grounds us back to it to say, hey, remember last week, when we looked at the video of how larva turns into a fly, let's remind ourselves with this visual. Got it. Cool. Let's move on. And it, it helps the students also be the scientists. So this question, these questions here are from the students. It's important that they are the question creators and no question is a bad question. We all know that there are some questions that are way off and that's okay. That might be in another section that says, you know, others or questions that we might not get to, but the way that we've kind of, or maybe questions that they, a student wants to inquire by themselves at home, that's kind of the side off questions, but most kids are going to come up with very similar questions because they think quite similarly often. Um, and you'll be able to take those questions and answer them through the investigations that you're doing. Um, this also helps with this big piece around consensus building. So you'll have something like, okay, here's one of our questions. What were the birds eating? And we're gonna have consensus that this is the answer. Little Tommy is going to, might argue and go, you know what? We've made consensus as a scientific team. This is our answer. I know you have a different thought and that's okay. But as a team, we've found evidence, enough evidence to make this our answer. So, right. Then you're not going off on these, all these different tangents just because someone has, doesn't want to kind of agree with what everyone else is doing. We use the word consensus. Whenever you are using this, 
you're constantly kind of bringing it back to how does this help us answer the big question? And in the end, you'll be able to use this and say, look at what all the things that we figured out. Look at, and if someone's like, oh, I don't know, or they have a different idea, be like, well, do you have evidence? Let's go back to our driving question board or let's go back to your notebook. What evidence do you have? So it's bringing it back to a scientific experience, just like scientists do. Um, it doesn't have to be on the whiteboard or on a big bulletin board. I personally like it on a big bulletin board, but not everybody has the space. Um, you can do it digitally. Um, you can have it something on um, an anchor chart and have it come up and down as need be. Um, any questions about the driving question board? I'm going to go over the how to do a driving question board on Thursday, um, how to create it with your students. But if there's any kind of initial thoughts, has anyone done this before? Um, is this something you can see yourself doing? What do you like about it? What's a little um, maybe intimidating by it? Of it? I like it. <laughs> Sorry, I like it because it gives it empowers the kids to ask questions or come up with it. Kind of get their curiosity going, and then they, they put the questions out there, and then they go and they start investigating their questions. Um, so I like the empowerment there. It's empowerment and it's buy-in. Right? They're all, everyone has a question up there. Everyone is bought into this experience. So we all want to know what, you know, what are the answers to our question, right? Anyone else? Jamie, uh, I'm thinking that maybe most teachers are, fami are more familiar with project-based learning. If that's the case, do you want to talk a little bit about the difference of phenomenal-based learning and why the switch to from project-based learning to phenomenal based learning is is more critical yeah. now um i made the switch as well which was um i still kind of embed a bit of the aspects of project-based learning in there um but the difference of project-based learning versus a phenomena based learning is that in phenomena based learning you're trying to explain something that's happening in the world. Whereas in project-based learning, you are trying to create, you're learning through creating something. And you're learning through building and creating uh, whatever it, whatever need it there is for the particular audience. In phenomena-based learning, your audience are your fellow scientists. Your audience are the general public. Um, and your audience is really you. So you're, you're trying to figure it out for yourself. Um, in the in some units, in engineering units, you'll see that it has the aspects of a project-based learning. When we're trying to build homes in a particular climate, it has the aspects of a project-based learning unit where we're saying, who is this for? What do they need? Um, how do we make sure that all of the needs are met? Um, Whereas in phenomena-based learning, it's just, it's explaining. It's trying to explain why or how it happened. Um, the instructional piece around giving them the time to go and just do is also a little bit different. Um, sometimes you'll see in project-based learning, every kid will have their own little project and they're like, and with the same idea, and they're gonna go on with their group and figure it out. This is much more a collective piece and they'll be coming to consensus maybe in small groups and bringing it together in a bigger, um, as a bigger audience or a large class. The hard part I think that I've seen student or teachers with that shift is um, the inquiry piece. And a lot of times they wanna let the kids just go and like figure it out. But as I discussed before, there's a lot of explicit teaching of, uh, and specific skills that are being taught. So in this unit, for example, 
yes, everyone had different questions. And yes, we eventually answered each of those questions, but we did a lot of things together and came to consensus with a consensus model, but they also had time to do their own independent experiments based off of a, of a, a question. So you might notice in this one, they were looking at the mold of a fruit and the data. So they chose the fruit that they wanted, but they had a similar, and they chose how it was gonna be stored. And then they looked at the mold um, versus the strawberry and how much, and how that kind of over time would happen. It's different because they have a similar question around that. It's the same because they're they're giving they're given the chance to kind of go and do this on their own, but with maybe tighter parameters than project based learning, I would say. Um, does anyone have questions about that? I hope that makes sense. I'm happy to kind of as you guys go through and things kind of come up, I'm happy to make some clarifications around that too. Um, Thank you, Jamie. Um, the next thing is around a summary chart. And this is one of my um, favorite things to do in elementary school um, with elementary school students because, let's see if that'll take me there. And the reason I love it so much is because it helps solidify, again, solidify and build consensus around um, essentially the, the core idea. So if the core idea is that the earth has different um, climate zones and each climate zone has a different weather pattern throughout the year. Well, we are gonna come to consensus with that together, but just in case someone forgets, we have our summary chart. And I'll send you guys this to kind of read through. It's a lot of reading. I didn't want to take us, take the time to sit and dive into it. But here's an example of like a, of one that is, this is a middle school one, this first one. And it's a picture or a drawing of the activity that they did. What did they notice? Kind of your analysis, why did it happen? And then how does this connect to our phenomena? My suggestion as a elementary teacher would be to do this as a whole group. You might have them do parts of this independently, bring it together as a whole group, but you as the teacher are the in charge of putting the items on the summary chart. You might also have them do their own to keep it going. Um, again, activity, what did we observe? What did we learn? And how does it help us explain the phenomena? It's really awesome on the summary chart to go back at the, like at the end of a unit and to like, it, let's say you put one summary chart on one anchor chart and you kind of put them all out and you'll look at all the things that we've done, right? Look at all of, this, oh yeah, that's right, we did that experiment, because kids are gonna forget. Units go over time, holidays happen, events happen at school, and you may, might miss some days. This really helps also bring us back to what it is that we're doing, what we've done, and evidence that we've gathered already. Um, you will go, I actually give you guys examples of what a summary chart looks like in the unit, um, but the other piece that's really nice in here is this is where we can also start to clarify vocabulary. And I'll get into that in the next piece. But what it might look like is when we talk about rain on land, well, we're gonna use a scientific word. Our common word is rain, but we're gonna start to use the word precipitation. That's our scientific word. So we might even have another column here of science words that we can use when describing what we've seen. That's a great way to introduce that, that scientific, new scientific vocabulary is in these discussions. 
Um, I'll give you guys these to read through to get to know kind of the thoughts behind it, um, how to introduce it, and you'll see it in the unit as well. It's um, I put kind of explicit teaching teachings um, vocabulary or teaching sentences in there for you guys. Um, any wonders about this? It, has anyone used a summary chart before for other things, maybe in math or in reading? I've never used one before, but I really like everything that we do now. It, it goes back to the why. And, you know, it like you were talking about multiplication earlier, and we no longer do the rote memory. We're explaining why it is three times four twelve. So I like the summary chart because it really helps them see the why and really helps them answer that question. And like I said, so much of what we do now, whether it's in our ELA, whether it's in our math, it all goes back to the why. And the reasoning behind that is actually around how our brains learn. And it's, and I'm sure you guys know this as well from um, your teaching, um, that students, when they have a reason why they're doing something, they're more invested in it. And if they're trying to figure it out themselves, um, there's, it sticks in, in their brain in another place, in a couple other places a bit longer. Um, So I talked a bit about this idea of learning vocabulary like scientists, and this kind of goes also with this idea of the questions is that instead of giving the students a question saying, here's the question where you're going to answer, it comes to going, oh, I hear you talking about that you saw things bubbling. The water was bubbling when it got hot. You know, we, we, we often use that and we say it, it's boiling. Okay. And then, but you know, scientists have an even more scientific word for it. They say it's vaporizing. And then kids are like, ooh, vaporizing. So we have earned this word vaporize, guys. And we put it up on our board and we say, you've earned it or evaporated, right? The idea behind it is that we could have said, here's the word vaporize. You're going to see it. Remember the word vaporize. And there's going to be a few that will remember it, and there'll be a few that didn't, and they're going to get to it and go, what is happening? Right? Why? What's, what's vaporize? Whereas if they use it bubbles, it boils, or it vaporizes, we know that they're communicating, right? We know that they're they're understanding the content, right? That one of those three three dimensions, they're working maybe on specific communication of how they explain themselves. It really is a fun way to kind of get students to use that vocabulary as well. Um, and like I said, you can add it to the summary chart, you can add it to your driving question board, have a whole section on there of like science words we've earned or um, science, scientific terminology and the everyday word, right? So it helps those kids that are going, all right, well, I see the word vaporize and don't know what that is, but oh, that's right. It's like bubbles. Okay. Doesn't take away from them taking in the content or taking the information in because they don't know the word. Um, You'll, you might see in the unit, I mentioned tiered words. So a tier one word, um, and if any of you guys have taken your um, ELL classes or um, done any of that type of diving in, it's the words that every kind of people know, a lot of people know. Um, tier two words are words that we um, are, could be across multiple subjects, right? Um, I think of the idea of cause and effect. We use the word cause in reading, in science, in writing, right? Effect, we're gonna use that in multiple places, right? Tier three words are very specific to just science, like vaporize, right? Or photosynthesis. It does, photosynthesis does not move across the math and reading piece unless you're reading about photosynthesis. Um, 
and keeping this in mind that there are these words and you can kind of say everyday mm -hmm. words the word that we are that are common to us and very specific science words um and then this kind of goes with the terminology and i will send you these as well but science discourse and science talk moves go with the well does anyone i can kind of i don't really want a cold call but it anyone have an idea of which practices it uses when we do our science discourse and our talk moves um anyone go back should i go back So again, similar to what we talked about here, it's really all of this, all of this, right? As we are explaining ourselves, we need to be able to do it in a way that communicates what we're thinking, but also allows us, the people who are listening, to understand. So things like, how do we talk to our, each other as scientists, right? And in science, you're gonna have people who disagree and that's okay, right? You want students to be, to question each other, right? I'll send you these slides as well if you wanna use them. It's nice it's at the start of the year for anything really. I use it in math as well. Um, It's a little robotic, but eventually the kids kind of make it their own. Um, but it's really nice for those that have no idea what, how to start what they want to say. Um, and and then this is those sentence stems that I shared with you guys. Um, told you guys I was going to share is you'll see it follows the cross-cutting concepts, right? Cause and effect, right? Same and different, right? How do I compare things to be the same or different? Um, the nice piece of this, you can do this with with your students, make something like this. If you're talking about cause and effect or if you're talking about patterns, you might make a sentence frame like this. It says, oh, a pattern I noticed is X, Y, Z. So bringing them into creating these is really great. You as a team might want to think about creating some of these as um, that fit your students' um, reading and speaking levels. Um, the reason I like these is that it gives them kind of heavier words to use than, oh, you know, I think the same, right? Or I disagree. So why do you disagree, right? How do you, ex how do you get them to explain cause and effect? The boy with the magnet, he needed help explaining cause and effect, right? He could have said, oh, since... I have three of these small ones, they, it goes further and I'm trying to, it goes further because it's more powerful, right? And that helps, that'll help him explain what he has figured out. Similar to how you guys do math and reading and writing, it's giving them the tools that help them be successful, right? You want them to be able to talk about their reading. You want them to talk about their science um, and sentence stems and visuals and things like that are really great for that. Um, 
any kind of wonders about any of these tools, anything, any tools that you guys have used that aren't on here that you think are really beneficial to science learning, science teaching? There's, you know, people here with, you know, collective probably a hundred years of teaching experience. So any other tools that you guys like to use or anything you want to add to these? I was going to add, I'm sure it fits into one of these, but just um, the student science journals, I love when they write down their thoughts and their question, I'm sure it fits um, in these as well, but just their journals. And we um, like to pull up what that scientists keep journals and notes as well, and kind of the important parts to put in there. And so I'm sure that would work um, for building um, either in the diving question board or to build the summary chart and everything. So. I just like to always keep them there. What side just keep their journals as well? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, some some teachers really like to have the summary chart. Um, the students do it independently first in their notebooks, and then bring it together as a team and share out. And then students kind of add what is on the collective, the consensus chart. Um, same thing with vocabulary. If you have like a a page in your notebook that is those three things like here's the word here's kind of a common word here's the scientific word and maybe a picture um, of it or something like that um, or even have it on the same page that they did that experience um, and even putting some of these talk moves printing them and putting it in their science notebook so they have easy access to it when they are doing partner discussions um, and you can just say hey go why don't you go back to your discourse thing and start A, B, A, B, and having that for them. Giving them those tools to talk like scientists and experience the language of science is, is probably the newer-ish part of this, as opposed to just doing an activity and saying, good job, that was fun, peace out. Like, it's, it's a, okay, so let's talk about what happened and how does it link to what we're doing and what else do we want to know um sometimes on the summary chart there's like a more questions section because kids will always be like oh you know oh there's more questions of course there are because scientists have more questions ideas lead to more ideas so that's a great point that if you do have those notebooks or if you have digital notebooks um whatever it is that you end up using as a teacher There'll be a lot of opportunity for that. Anything, any other tools that you guys um, want to add to or find helpful in here? All right. Okay, well, as promised. exit ticket um, and have a think I don't have the padlet I thought I made the padlet well I have an eight week old so I obviously didn't um, but if anyone wants to add to the discussion um, that we did at the beginning the chart that um, I sent you guys. If you guys at the bottom have any desire to add thought or a new something new, I'm going to put this back up. So if you take some time just to write down anything that is coming to mind, um, 
maybe wonders that you would really like to be um, discussed on Thursday. So I can make sure I, I fit that in. Um, things that you are excited to try, some shifts that you're looking at making. Um, maybe not your next science lesson, but in future science lessons. So then if you add that to the bottom there, that'll help me also plan for Thursday. If there's any big questions that you guys have that you really want to make sure are answered. Um, any wonders, I like to call them wonders. It feels less intimidating with students. <laughs> what do you wonder? Versus do you have a question? No, I don't have a question. <laughs> And I'll stay on for a bit if anyone wants to chat or um, wants to discuss anything else. But um, I really want to say appreciate your time. And I know that there's so many things going on at the start of the year. So you guys taking the time to be here and um, learn about this way of teaching. And hopefully it was a good use of your time. Um, I know that. There's so many great things coming in your students' future. So just hearing how you guys are passionate already, they're very lucky. Amy, thank you so much for your for your time today. We really appreciate you talking with us. So um, I'm excited. I love uh, this is so the second time I've sort of sat through this <laughs> through this training, and I still always pull something new from it. So thank you so much for your time today too. We appreciate it.